Today we're talking to Lloyd Ernst of CloudStaff. CloudStaff is a BPO operation that has quite a technical platform uh, integration on top of it. Uh, Lloyd Ernst uh, has very good pedigree in terms of building tech companies. Uh, and today from Lloyd, you can get a lot of insight in terms of outsourcing, how best to utilize it, and how an outsourcing provider with a technical overlay can help you reach your goals. Let me start with a little bit of history. Um, so I originally started working with Microsoft and then the internet came along and had a, an ISP and a web hosting business in Australia. Uh, we grew the ISP called PowerUp to uh, Queensland's largest ISP and sold that through to uh, Aussie Mail and then uh, started a new venture which was a web hosting business called Web Central that we grew and sold that across to the same people which is uh, sort of Malcolm Turnbull and Sean Howard and Trevor Kennedy from Aussie Mail side of things. So. Uh, Malcolm was the uh, chairman of Goldman Sachs at the time and is now the current PM. So uh, the, um, and then uh, after I, I sold that business, um, I was always keen on, on, on offshoring and outsourcing. And so I wanted to move into the field of software development. And Web Central had done a little bit of work up in China. And so uh, I went up to China and started a uh, offshore development uh, facility in Beijing. And we had two offices in China one in Beijing and one in Xi'an, and we had about 200 odd staff uh, in that business. Um, and then that was back in about 2004. And as that, uh, the economy grew and uh, in, in, in China, you know, there was uh, certain pressures with regards to wages. But then we were also finding customers uh, looking for services like QA testing, which we just couldn't do because of the, uh, the language barrier. So in about 2010, we ran a pilot down in the Philippines uh, we hired seven staff and uh, we literally ran from an apartment and uh, we, we had a look at uh, how easy would it be to do software QA testing. Uh, and that worked really well. And uh, after six months went, wow, you know, it's a happy customers and everything works kind of well. And uh, so we then started offering that service and, and expanding it. So we started off in software QA testing. Uh, we've, uh, um, uh, we had, we employed seven staff. Today we have uh, over 1,300 and we still have five of those original staff with us. Uh, and as we started offering more and more QA services, we then started expanding into software development, into business services, and sort of a whole range of, of services offering towards uh, SME customers in Australia and the US and the UK. I got into outsourcing originally because with Web Central we had very much a technology business. It was all about how do you build scalable platforms. And at the board meetings, you know, we would have the board sitting around there saying, you know, when are you going to get rid of those software developers? And I think we had six or seven billing developers because we built our own platform. There just wasn't anything available at the time. And so, uh, you know, the board kept looking at this going, you know, there's a, there's a million dollars on the bottom line. Well, when does this project finish? And the reality was that, you know, we actually needed six more developers and that, you know, the project was never going to finish because, you know, you were always innovating, you're always adding that next component, you're always expanding the platform. And so, uh, and it was difficult to find the resources in Australia. You know, by the time you advertised, you hired, you interviewed, you went through the pro whole process, you selected someone and then they probably wanted a month holiday and then it took them three months to ramp up. So it was six months before you could really start to, uh, you know, get any sort of momentum behind these projects. So that's why uh, originally we started looking originally at, at China as the market for outsourcing, and it was really about trying to access uh, the talent that was there in, in the in the quantities that was available. We started in China in about 2004, 2005, and then the Philippines about five years later in about 2010. One of the key premises or the fundamental foundations of our business is the fact that we believe that businesses will get smaller in the future. And there's some research which is done out of the London Business School and they, they study generational workplace change. And so they feel that if you have a business or an enterprise today with a thousand employees, in a few years time, you might only have 600 employees, but you'll have 3,000 employees who are working in the gig economy, the freelancer, offshore, outsourced model. So businesses, and the reason that, they, that we're seeing that shift in businesses 
there is an, there's an element of economics around that, of course, but it's also that businesses just don't have time. So you focus your energy on those secret source people, the people that are directly contributing to the value inside your business. And it's not to say that those 3,000 employees aren't important, they are. It's just you just don't have time and energy to be able to manage that because everything is becoming shorter and shorter time frames. You know, people expect products delivered uh, earlier and faster and the whole business uh, heartbeat continues to accelerate. I think that you, you do have to make sure that when you enter the, you know, the, the offshore mar market, uh, you know, the people that you employ today, you have to move them up the food chain. Because you know, the, this, the inflation is running here at three to four percent a year. You know, there's an expectation of salary increases, uh, and the employees have to return an efficiency, dividend, a productivity dividend. You've got to keep improving the skills that people have here. Uh, so I think that there is certainly the uh, the, the ability and the, the the talent, and so we invest very heavily in in training programs. Uh, we run a whole lot of special interest groups at uh, Cloud Staff. Uh, you know, which range from PHP to machine learning, artificial intelligence. And the idea is you, you keep uh, educating staff and keep moving them up through the food chain. The 10 years that I've, I've been here, I think one of the things that we've seen change is um, the types of businesses that are starting to use out, uh, offshoring and outsourcing. Uh, Ten years ago, it was primary, l primarily larger corporations, and, and they could outsource because you know they had the procedures, they had the connectivity, they had all the technical people. Um, and what we're starting to see over the last few years is the emergence of more and more small to medium enterprises coming in, into the market here, and, and that's, that's that's changed because of this move to the cloud. Something interesting uh, that 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 we kind of view is that. Um, Ten years ago, um, if you're a business in Australia or the US or the UK, somewhere inside your business was a server, running small business server from Microsoft. And it used to run your Microsoft Exchange, it had your file server, which had your MYOB and your accounting software on it. It had your Word documents and your Excel spreadsheets, um, and it probably had ACT for managing your contacts. So everything was running inside the business. Um, and when you had, and, and the business had an ADSL connection to the internet, but that was kind of it. When you have that type of uh, technology infrastructure, it is very, very difficult for people outside of the business to get access to the Word documents, the Excel spreadsheets, the accounting systems. No, there's no terminal server and the internet connection it doesn't, doesn't really support uh, people coming in from the outside. And so the move to the cloud, which has occurred probably over the last five years, um, has really opened that up because there's this technology barrier that has been removed. So the business made a, a decision to move to the cloud because, well, I don't need a UPS and I don't need a server and I don't need a tech support guy in my office to make all this stuff work. I can move to the cloud. So we saw uh, you know, the Word and Excel documents move to Office 365 or Google Docs. You saw the Exchange server move again to uh, uh, Gmail, uh, the accounting software, Xero, NetSuite, Salesforce, all these cloud-based applications. And so when the business moved to those applications, all of a sudden it's opened up the uh, availability of outsourcing. It removed that technology hurdle. So businesses now can, can employ people to either work from home, work from another office, or work from the Philippines. And that's been one of the key reasons that we're seeing small to medium enterprises embracing uh, outsourcing, uh, not just the corporate uh, uh, guys uh, with their uh, you know, two to 500 seat uh, um, um, companies here. The primary barriers that we see to offshoring is the, you know, a lot of businesses haven't got the processes right. You can't move a process offshore if it's broken. Um, and so there's a bit of a mindset change as well as to, you know, what people can actually do. And, and people tend to be so busy that they just don't have time to invest in getting this up and, up and running. So we, in, we encourage people to, uh, when they start to look at uh, offshoring, is to come up spend some time with the team, 
to actually do the training. Uh, and you know, it, it doesn't have to be here for a month, it's a week or two weeks. And that is really, uh, we find that that means uh, the, the, the staff and, and everyone gets to uh, sort of uh, communicate a lot better and, and then uh, it works, uh, uh, we find a lot more successful outcomes. I think where we see, I guess, the future, it's, it's going to be what you, it's what you can't outsource. And you can't outsource the, you know, that, uh, that product management, that innovation, you know, the, uh, the guys that are your secret source people. They're, they're the, the and, and so outsourcing is really about giving them the platform, giving them the resources to be able to sort of grow the business. And again, I keep talking about, you know, working on the business and not in the business. And I think that's really what, uh, what outsourcing is, is providing uh, those, those businesses. The eureka moments that we see when customers come across is they'll come across with a certain level of expectation as to what the staff can actually do. And they'll, we, we encourage the customers, you know, start to pick those, those processes that are going to give you the early win, the low hanging fruit. And when they come across and they start to, you know, work with the team and they get some processes up and running, all of a sudden they find the, uh, you know, the, the, the opportunity to say, oh, well I can do this or I can expand this and add this other component. And so that's the bit where, where, where the light really comes on when we have customers come through the office and they'll look at one customer who is uh, you know, doing accounts receivable, payroll, then another customer that's doing tech support, another customer that's uh, you know, designing uh, 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 you know, circuits or another, another customer that's uh, uh, you know, working in uh, telesales. So there's a whole range of different uh, uh, ex sort of experiences that people see when they come over here. I think with outsourcing, it doesn't happen overnight. If you come up here with an expectation that, hey, this is going to be up and running in a week or two weeks, and everything's you know the, the uh, everything's going to be rosy, you know, it, it takes a lot longer than that. Um, and it's partly not just the staff here, but it's also the staff back in the local country. You know, you need to make sure that you address you know what it is you're actually doing. You know, we're not about going through and getting rid of a whole lot of jobs. You know, this is a really about freeing up the time of your onshore staff so that your offshore team uh, can sort of focus on those particular tasks. With Cloud Staff, we really uh, try to build a platform um, which allows businesses to be able to come up here and put together a multi-skilled team. I think one of the challenges with offshoring and outsourcing is that you know, you, if you go through and choose a provider who might focus on accounting and another provider that might focus on, on marketing, you end up having to deal with two different providers, uh, you know, different holidays, different invoicing, different staffing issues. And, and so when we put cloud staff into, uh, when we started building the cloud staff platform, we wanted to be able to allow businesses to slot in different skill sets. So we'll see customers that have got accounting staff and they've got design staff and they've got tech support staff all sitting in one office. And you know, all the offices are, are branded and themed uh, they, you know, and they have the, 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 the company culture you know, coming through there as well. Uh, so I think that's probably you know, one of the, those, uh, the moments where you go, wow, this is yeah, really, really very, uh, this is kind of the way in which everyone's will be doing it in the future. 50% of the effort needs to go into getting the processes up and running. Um, as said, if a process is already broken, you can't move it up here. You've got to make sure that you get the, the team on the onshore country on board. You've got to explain to them what's actually going on. You've got to be clear from day one. And, and you've got to make them part of the solution, uh, not, not make them feel that they're, they're being replaced uh, inside there as well. Um, and, and, and part of that is about getting the communication going between the two teams. And so we find that you know, when you take someone from, the, uh, from your, your local country and, and send them up to the Philippines and do a visit and spend some time and have a few beers with the guys, um, you know, the barriers really come down. So I've got a couple of tips and suggestions. And, and one of them is that, 
you know, the, uh, this, this four hour work week, you know, it's, it's a load of bull. It, it doesn't really happen like that. You're not going to magically go and get yourself a virtual assistant who is going to free up four hours a day. But what you do find is that, you know, you, you, you get the savings in these smaller blocks. So I run about uh, uh, two or three uh, PAs and, uh, and I, have, uh, I stagger the shifts. So uh, I'll have uh, Janice who will, uh, you know, work from about uh, 8 p.m. Uh, and uh, Anne who starts at about 6 a.m. And, and so literally, um, you know, you've, you've got that sort of coverage. And so when I, when I need a task done, I'll just flip it through to the guys and, and away it will go. Um, and, and so there's the, 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 the careful thing though is that in, in, in a lot of countries, you know, when, you, when you've got staff, you make sure that you, know, you just maximise the amount of time. You know, they're all, you know, they've always got to have something to, to do there. They've always got to be busy. And you can make that mistake here in the Philippines because you know, um, I always make sure that the staff have headroom. So you know, are my PAs busy you know, all the time? No. But when I want something done, I can flip it through and it gets executed. You know, they've got headroom, they've got time to be able to do the tasks now. Um, and then at the same time, you have a, a pool of tasks that they can then be doing uh, you know, when they do have free time. Um, but it is a, but don't, you can, you can make the mistakes, mistake of spending all your time trying to make sure that the staff here are actually busy. If you're starting to look at offshoring and outsourcing, you need to probably try to choose a, the, what's a low hanging fruit. In a lot of cases, it's probably more on the lines of accounting. Accounts receivable, accounts payable, e even payroll. Um, it does take a while to get a good virtual assistant up and running because there's a lot of information that's trapped up in your head and you've got to get that uh, across. Uh, so, uh, you know, our recommendation is probably choosing a couple of the other areas. Um, we also find some success in uh, uh, sales administrators, uh, you know, being able to manage sales teams because you've got a fairly defined sort of set of tasks that they actually do. Um, a lot of back office uh, work, again, where you can document the process, uh, you know, that works very well as well. So start off, but you need to get a win. You know, you can't come up and sort of try a few things and then have it all fail on you. So choose the, the tasks that you know are going to be the ones that uh, uh, can be achieved. Uh, and, and then once, you, once everyone starts to see how well that works, then you can start to work on the next tasks. One of the interesting things about Asia, and, uh, and yes, some people tend to have some unrealistic expectations as to the skill sets that people have. One of the differences in, in any Asian country, and it's not just the Philippines, is that you know, staff here tend to specialise. Back in markets like Australia and, and the US, and, and let's look at something like software development, you know, you, you don't have the same, um, you know, talent pool or, or which, is, which is available in, in Australia. So, you know, for instance, you'll, you'll get a developer and that developer will be good at SQL and they'll be good at front end and they'll be good at APIs and they'll, 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 they'll get a whole range of skills, which is, which is really fantastic. Uh, but it's, it's simply because, you know, we don't have the resources to be able to have lots of people specialising. In, in a lot of Asian countries, whether it's China or the Philippines, uh, you know, people want to be specialists. You know, I'm a SQL guy or I'm the front end designer or, and they'll just focus on one area. So when you come up here and try to find someone who's got access to a whole range of skills in one person, it's just not the way in which the, which, which the economy is wired here. So with cloud staff, we really don't see ourselves as a classic BPO. You know, we are building a platform here. Uh, we deal with small to medium enterprises. Uh, we don't deal with sort of you know, big, large uh, corporations who want 500 seat seats to go and chase credit card debt. That's not the market that we're in. We're in the small to medium enterprise space. So our customers are looking for staff that can can have a broad range of skills. So where, where they want to be able to put together a team that has, you know, again, accounting experience, back office experience, and they can sort of assemble uh, a team that is multi-skilled. 
Um, and, and so, and the, and the reason being that is, is that you know, the SME, SME market is, is absolutely huge. Uh, and it's an area which uh, you know, I think is, is still starting to open up and can really benefit from uh, you know, what offshoring and outsourcing can provide. Cloud stuff, I guess, is very much a technology company. Um, it's the, the, we, uh, um, the staff, for instance, you know, if they're running late, uh, they pick up their phone and they, they run the Cloud Staff app and they can report that the fact that you know, they're running late or if they want to order lunch or if they want to see what the Chook Lotto numbers are this week, if they want to uh, listen to a radio station. So we run a, a radio station with two DJs and so if you're sitting in the office doing data entry work, you can tune into the radio station or you go to the bathrooms and the radio will be playing through there. Um, so we try to um, uh, put together, I guess, uh, a, a, a sort of a different in, environment, if you like, um, and uh, we also uh, run about uh, uh, you know 23 different uh, uh, groups and special interest groups in cloud staff. Um, you know everything from runners to the frisbee group through to PHP developers and uh, you know dance group, basketball teams. I think we've got three bands, eight basketball teams, um, and I think there's about 50 people in the badminton club. So. Uh, you know, I said it, it is a it's a it's a different model that we pursue, and the and the reason that we we try to do that is that we want to be able to attract very good talent, um, and uh, we want to retain the talent, and it's what our customers you know, want to know that their staff are being well looked after. So we use technology to be able to scale, and look, you know, the the, the people are the most important part of our our our, our pitch. And you know, we really try to uh, you know, hire for attitude, train for skills. But you support them with the technology. Uh, you know, we said the, uh, you know, if, if people need to get from one building to another, you know, there's a mobile phone app that they can pick up. And it's part of our, our mobile first strategy that we have for the staff. You know, it's to give the staff the tools. If they've got a technical problem, uh, they can pick up their phone press a button and a tech will turn up and, and, and resolve the issue. So, so we use technology as an enabler. Um, we also, um, at the same time, we see a, a big future in machine learning and artificial intelligence. A and uh, so we have a team of people that, are, uh, that, that build the, the training platforms the, uh, to, and, uh, and then we actually train the staff uh, that are doing the back office work to be the ones that are training those bots and, and putting all the, uh, the business process and all the business logic into those AI systems. AI machine learning is going to be one of the big disruptors in the, in the probably more so the call center, call center business. If you look at uh, you know, uh, um, you know, large, large call centers, um, you know, they are, there's, a, there's a risk that those jobs are going to be replaced by uh, mobile, uh, by customers uh, uh, using uh, self-service applications on their mobile phone. And then at the same time, uh, you know, uh, automatic chatbots, those sort of things, solving those sort of problems. But we think that the, uh, with machine learning and artificial intelligence, the big, the big one has got to be what we call enterprise assistance. Uh, and, and that's where you know, businesses start to embrace this technology uh, and use it. So a uh, series of, everyone knows Siri on, on, on their phone. And, but if you ask Siri, Siri, what day is payday at CloudStaff? Or what color shirt do I wear at CloudStaff? Or can I bring my dog to work? You know, Siri doesn't know. And, and, but the, the ability to, to deliver these enterprise assistance uh, is going to be an absolute huge. It's going to be a, uh, one of the, the big waves of technology coming through in the future. And so one of the things that we're doing at Cloud Staff is building platforms and training the staff that we have today, you know, the guys that are sort of doing the back office processing so they can be the ones that are training the bots, doing the implementation, not the ones that are being replaced by the technology. Challenge though is getting the information out of people's head and into into the sort of systems. Uh, but you know the the, the benefits it delivers, um, uh, you, know, uh, you can get a return on that investment very very quickly. So I think we'll see a lot more businesses in, embracing uh, you know these enterprise assistants within inside their their companies.